Let us rise. Grace, mercy, and especially God's peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends of Christ, the basis for our meditation today is the Gospel text from Luke 9. Uh, it is Transfiguration Sunday. And so we read, Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything that they had seen. Here is the text. You may be seated. As we begin with Transfiguration Sunday, one of the things which they, they always say, well, Peter didn't know what he was talking about when he said, let's build three tents or three booths. And he didn't know, he didn't understand, if you will, that Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, even though they talked about his departure. And the reason why that comment would have come up why he would have said, let's build three booths for people to come here, is because the Mount of Transfiguration, if you think of the Holy Land, kind of like my hand, okay, I've lived in Michigan, which you go like this, and Wisconsin, which you go like this, and you can tell where you live. But the Holy Land actually is fairly good as a hand, but it's only about 30 miles long. And at the bottom is the Dead Sea down here, and at the top, is the Sea of Galilee and where the waters enter into the Sea of Galilee and the River Jordan flows between them. That would kind of be your lifeline on your hand. River Jordan, lifeline, kind of fits. But up on the northern portion of Israel, this is where we believe the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration was. And you see, up in this northern part, right before you entered Israel, when you were traveling, you came across this fertile crescent and you wound up at the top of Israel. And because caravans and trips were hard, and they took a long time, and the kids often said, are we there yet? Are we there yet? When the people would arrive at Jerusalem, they were, they were, when they would arrive in Israel, they were kind of coming into safe territory. And up in the northern Sea of Galilee, there is still, to this day, a mountain with a sheer face that carved into it is a bunch of little niches where they would place all these gods of other countries. They were false gods, and it wasn't in the land of Israel, so they could get away with it. But when the travelers would arrive, they would go to that mountain, and they would give thanks to their god for the fact that they had been blessed in their journey that they had made it through. And so now in this place, Peter sees Jesus and Moses and Elijah, and he says, let us build three booths. Because, my goodness, if they're going to worship these gods made of stone and this mountain, they should come and worship you. That's kind of the history of that. And Jesus says, no, you still don't get it. We'll take care of that. But so that's kind of why he says that. That's just an aside. That's not part of the sermon. But when we talk about transfiguration and Jesus being transfigured, I wanted to go back in your life, and maybe it's been a long time, maybe it's been a short time, but I'm going to go back to my 7th and 8th grade year in school. And what was really interesting, I have been blessed. I have had great choral directors all my life. In 7th and 8th grade, I had a choral director named Mrs. Nolan. Now, Mrs. Nolan was not even, I don't think, 5 feet, except she had this brown fro that, that made her a little taller. But all the kids, all the guys in, in, the, in the men's chorus that we had in the boys' choir, I should say, were pretty much all taller than her. We just thought she was crazy. Because she was energetic, she went all over, man, she was nuts. And she was so crazy that she took our 
seventh and eighth grade boys chorus to the National Music Association uh, convention. She was invited because she did special work with, with young men's voices and with young boys' voices, and so they invited her to give a seminar on how she worked. Now, so she was invited and she took us, the whole choir, as we went, and we went from Ohio all the way to Wisconsin. Again, a crazy lady to drag all these young men that far. To go three states away. This would be similar to saying, well, you know, to take Calvary and say, we, we, we have a great choir here, let's go to Colorado. The parents would go, are you nuts? But so we drove all the way to Wisconsin, and we still, of course, think Mrs. Nolan is nutty. Well, she still was. But what was interesting is when we arrived in Wisconsin, and all the national music directors, all these choral directors were there, Mrs. Nolan was transformed in our eyes. She was transfigured, if you will. Because here was this little woman who we just thought was a little bit crazy and a really fun person, but just nuts. And suddenly we realized she's well respected. People were listening to her, whom we, we just kind of blew her off, quite honestly. We're seventh and eighth grade boys. And so she was transfigured to us, and suddenly she appeared as something other than, than we had originally thought she was. She gained, if you will, a word we didn't know at that point, gravitas. She, she gained an impressive look in our eyes. She never seemed as small or as short or as crazy again. And I don't know who in your life has been transfigured before your eyes. It may have been on a day when your dad took you to work. It may have been an opportunity when you had had some, some event occur and, and you realized this person really knows their stuff. It may have been that your, your child was transfigured when you recognized that, boy, they are important in their industry, whatever it may be. You, you hear about them and you realize they, they, people actually come to them for advice. They know what they're talking about. When we remember you know, changing their diapers. And so transfigured literally means change. Something becomes different. And on Transfiguration Sunday, it's not the fact that Jesus turns and his clothes turn all white as we read in one account. They shine like everything. And, but for Peter, James, and John, what happens is the purpose of a transfiguration. And that purpose was to demonstrate that he was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That they might truly recognize who he was because he was now getting ready to go to Jerusalem. He was now going to face his death and he was now going to face the crucifixion and the, the, the tomb and then be raised from the dead. Things were going to change. Everything was going to be different. And so although they had spent three years with Jesus, although they had seen the miracles, although they had seen all this stuff I sometimes wonder whether they really understood because they kept constantly saying, now are you going to restore the kingdom? Or basically, in, in God's terms, are we there yet? And Moses and Elijah appear to Jesus not for his strength, not for his, his ability, but that they might recognize who he truly is. You see, now this, this is an interesting occasion because it gives us a glimpse of the fact that we will go to be in heaven when we die. Because, you know, sometimes there's a question, well, what happens when we die? Well, Elijah was physically taken from earth, and so he could reappear. reappear. But Moses died. That's what, our first text, that's what our first text was about. And Moses was buried, and yet Moses appears. So, so don't let anybody ever tell you, well, when you die, you don't go to heaven right away. Because we've got a, a evidence that we, we do go and dwell in heaven. And that we are recognizable. They were recognizable by Peter, James, and John that, that this was Moses. Again, in one of the other texts, we see Jesus and telling them as they go, they don't tell anybody because who's going to believe them? You know, we went up on the mountain, and guess what? We were on the mountain, and, and Moses and Elijah appeared. And the other nine apostles and the, other, and the other, other followers of Jesus, which were much more numerous, would have said, yeah, uh-huh, we believe you. But he didn't want the apostles to tell, because it would have disrupted his timeline. You see, Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew where he was going. He knew what his, his mission was.
But guess what? His, his words don't tell anybody. His, the thought of the Peter, James, and John to be silent is no longer valid. We are the church of God and we are supposed to tell others what we have seen, what we have witnessed, how we have know that God is, is God because of the changes that we have seen in our lives, how we have been transfigured. And that's my next point. Have you been transfigured? And the answer, of course, is yes. You have been transfigured. And where was, did it occur? It occurred in your baptism. You see, in your baptism, God took someone who was born and was dead and made you alive. God took someone who was born and dead in sin, and he, he restored you to life. And this Wednesday, when we have Ash Wednesday, and we come and we put the ashes on our foreheads, guess what? It will be a time for us to shine. It will be a time for us to reflect the, God's glory. We are now in Christ a new creation. And we are the light of the world because we reflect the true light. We reflect the light of Jesus Christ. And so our question then becomes, what do we do with this? Peter, James, and John were, were told to be silent, and they were silent until probably after the resurrection. Although those apostles seemed to bicker like a bunch of old biddies, and you wonder if they didn't tell them earlier. And I'm sorry to any old biddies I offended. <laughs> But the question then becomes in our lives, who am I going to shine for this week? Who am I going to shine for this week? You see, because we are here to take forth, take the message of Jesus Christ forth. And so the question becomes who it is, and it may be someone in your household, it may be someone at work, it may be that you're, you're going to be an evangelist and talk to somebody whom you don't even know at a store, at a gas station, but for right now, I want you to write a name. Who am I going to shine for this week? Who am I going to exemplify Jesus for so much that they won't even have to ask me because they will recognize. They will recognize that Christ is shining through me. I don't think Moses and Elijah introduced themselves or Jesus said, hey guys, here's Moses and Elijah. They were recognized because of who they were, because of who they represented, because of who they served, because of who they followed. How is it with us? Are we recognized in the world as followers of Christ? This, oper this Wednesday, we have that opportunity as we wear those crosses on our forehead, those crosses of ash reminding us of, of how... <laughs> Christ has died for us, reminding us of the filth, of the dirt of our sin, as, as Hank shared with us. As we wear those messages forth and people will say, you got something on your forehead. Oh yeah, let me tell you about that. Let me have an opportunity to shine. That's why no matter what, I always try to go to the store after Ash Wednesday service, just so I can catch the teller. Just so when the cashier says, um, got something on your head, yeah, uh -huh. Ash Wednesday. So you've got to have a plan to be an evangelist. You've got to have a plan to share the gospel. So I ask you first to write a name of who you will pray for this week. Pray for and pray each day. How can I shine in their lives? How can I exhibit Christ to them? Because the reason the church is here is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. To build up believers and to send us out to share the good news of Christ with others. And so let us not only hear the word of God, let us keep it and let us share it. For indeed, you are the light of the world because you reflect the only true light, Jesus Christ. So as we go forth this day, let us rejoice in the promise that he has given us that he is indeed our Savior and our God. And may we share that love and that message with all. Amen. Let us rise.